Hello, I'm Jeremy Fleming from Your Active, and I'm joined this afternoon by Marion Harkin, who is an independent MEP from the north and west of Ireland, and we'll be discussing some issues surrounding health. Marion, I know that last week there was World Vision Day yes. in the Parliament, and you are one of a number of MEPs who have been calling for more action, policy action on site, and I just wondered if you could just tell us what your experience from the Irish perspective is. Indeed, and I have to say, Jeremy, that my eyes were opened, literally, because I personally wasn't aware of how an important issue this is. The National Council for the Blind in Ireland has done some research, and they estimate that the cost of impairment to vision and blindness in Ireland is running at about 116 million per year, and by 2020 they expect that to increase to 136 million per year. And that's the direct cost. It doesn't take into consideration all the indirect costs like loss of, of earnings and, and social welfare payments, all of that. That's just the healthcare issue. And what I've discovered through my research and, and my work with those who were involved in World Vision Day was the fact that a simple eye test is just as important as a cholesterol test. People, you know, will think now it is, oh, well, I need to go for a cholesterol test or I should have a smear test. But how many people think about their eye tests in the same way? And especially with high risk groups. And that would include the elderly and people who have certain diseases, for example, diabetes. Regular eye tests are absolutely crucial and quite a high percentage of visual impairment can be prevented by going to your optician, having the test done, and you know that uh, whatever treatment you need, etc., can be put in place. Now that's not true for every single disease, but it's true for the vast majority of uh, diseases that affect your eyes. Go and have an eye test on a regular basis, and especially if you're in a high risk group. Think of the difference it would make to the quality of life of older people. You know, this is something that we can deal with, and I hope that message gets out there. It is really, really important. Thanks very much for that. Um, just moving on to another issue that I know has interested you going through Parliament on herbal medicines. The, par the Parliament was not happy in some quarters with the Commission's proposals, and I know that you have supported some legal action there. Could you tell us what the latest on that is? Well, I suppose the very briefly the background for your listeners it, in this parliament we call it article 13 claims but what that means in simple language is the claims that can be for example on prunes because that was the one uh, food that everybody knows about prunes keep you regular basically and you know there are various claims for probiotics for cranberry juice um, things that our people are used to every day. And back in 2004, we passed legislation in this House to regulate that. It was good legislation, it was proportionate, and the industry and consumer organisations were happy with that. But what happened in the meantime was that EFSA used the highest possible standards to look at the, at foods and the, you know their their claims and the regulation itself was very clear that if a claim was being made in regard to children's health or to reducing disease a much higher standard of proof would have to be given that's reasonable efsa didn't do that they used the same high standard for all um, proofs so what that means in simple language is that there are, at the moment, 1,600 foods in a pending list. Now, I'll use the example of prunes because it initially was pending. Yeah. They now have approved it. So why? The reason is because there are a company out there that had the money, had the resources to invest in the type of uh, randomized control trials and other requirements. Uh, in order to prove the prunes keep you regular. Yeah. I suspect most of the people out there know that. <laughs> SMEs can't do that. That's way outside their scope. So now we have this situation where on the 14th of December this year, thousands of foods will have to take off health claims. For example, probiotics. Most of your listeners will know what a probiotic is or will have heard of it. 
and many of them will use probiotics as part of their overall health regime. The claims for probiotics will have to go. And this is disproportionate. It's not what the Parliament intended. And I suppose the final point I'd make about this, and this to me is crazy, and I can't find a better word to describe it. You know, sometimes they say the law is an ass. And the law is an ass when it can't be applied properly. The regulation now, as it stands, means that if you own a health food store in the west of Ireland or the northeast of England or anywhere in Europe, from the 14th of December onwards, you could be in trouble for giving advice to your customers as to the benefits of certain foods. For example, probiotics or other foods that are no longer on the positive list. In my opinion, it's legislation gone mad. And I don't think the Parliament, and I'll finish with this, I don't think the Parliament can be blamed. I think our regulation was, was pretty good and pretty proportionate. But unfortunately, the will of the Parliament was not followed and we ended up with something that is an absolute minefield. Right. Um, just quickly, on remaining on that issue, uh, it's a food issue. How does it affect non or herbal medicines as well? Well, botanicals are part of the claims there. So what the Commission have done is they've taken all the botanicals to one side and they're now on the pending list and they're looking at them. And they have two choices. Either they go ahead and try and assess them in the same way that EFSA have assessed up to now, which would be disaster, or they look at a completely new regulatory regime for all plant-based, for botanicals. We don't know what the Commission is going to do, but for now, they're in limbo. Right. And for those of your listeners who don't know where limbo is, it's supposed to be a place that's between heaven and a place called purgatory. So um, that means you're in no man's land. Right. And that's what's happening with botanicals at the moment. And I don't know what the Commission are going to do. When I said earlier this is a minefield, it is. I suspect a lot of people wished they'd never started down this pathway. Right. Just moving quickly on to professional qualifications, because I understand that you've made some amendments or you've tabled some amendments to proposals on that at the moment. Could you yes. explain briefly what those are? Well, look, if anybody ever asks me in one sentence to say, what is the European Union about? I have just one sentence. It's the free movement of goods, of people and of services. So we're talking about the second two here, the free movement of people and of services. So that if you're a professional, you can cross borders to uh, work there or to set up a business there to, to distribute a service. And I've been particularly interested in healthcare professionals. And one of the problems that exists at European level is that we have no overarching legislation that protects patient safety, because that is paramount in all of this. So I may have qualified in whatever my healthcare profession is, it doesn't matter, a dentist, a nurse, a doctor, whatever. I may have qualified 20 years ago with very high qualifications, etc. But what has been happening in, in that period of time? So we need a mechanism in place that can check fitness to practice? Are there issues about the healthcare professional? We need to look a little bit more carefully, I believe, in the healthcare area at language competencies, because that is absolutely crucial. Indeed, there has been an excellent programme developed uh, in connection with the European Commission. I know a group of nurses from Ireland and from the UK, Poland, Germany and a number of countries have developed a toolkit that nurses can use to help them if they're traveling from one member state to another. And it's not just about language, it's about culture, it's about understanding. But all of those issues are very important when healthcare professionals are moving. And we're now hopefully going to have the professional card. So I think what we're trying to put in place is something that will number one, guarantee patient safety, and number two, be proportionate on healthcare professionals. And I suppose the final comment I'll make about that is something called partial access. Yeah. Now that was in place where if your qualification in country A was so different from what was required in country B, 
that you could apply for something called partial access. Yeah. I believe in the area of healthcare and public health that should not be allowed. I think other areas, yes, but in that particular area, no. So we have to see what the rapporteur uh, decides on that. The committee I sit on, employment, is an opinion giving committee, and I was very pleased to see that. Uh, virtually all of my amendments went through but now we have to wait and see what the main committee says. But it's a very important issue for all European citizens because more and more people are crossing borders and we need to know that there are systems in place that protect our patients. Marion Harkin, this week has seen some very big news, the resignation or the sacking, depending on whose opinion you believe of John Daly, the Minister, the Health Commissioner uh, in Brussels. Um, firstly, do you think he was sacked or that he resigned? And what's the buzz in the Parliament uh, in relation to the, the, the departure of uh, the Maltese Commissioner? Well, I suppose the short answer to that is I don't know. And I, I won't comment because I don't have an inside track on this. So, you know, I suppose at one level, what the commissioner has done, whether he's done it or he's been forced to do it, I can't judge that. But it's good because it, it shows that, you know, the system works and the importance that citizens out there attach to transparency and that when decisions are taken, they're taken in the best interest of the citizens and not with other considerations in mind. I believe the Commissioner has said he is absolutely innocent in all of this and I take the man at his word. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I take him at his word. And I think he has done the right thing by standing aside. He hasn't implicated the Commission. He hasn't implicated his own DG and my understanding is that he's standing aside until this is sorted. It's difficult for him and it's difficult for him if he says he has nothing to do with this. But when it's sorted and hopefully it'll be dealt with quickly, then if, if that is the situation, he will be able to come back and, and be strengthened by it. But I think citizens will look at this and say, well, look, at least there's some system in place and at least it impacts at times. It's very difficult for me to judge because I have no inside track. But what I do want to say is that the legislation that's in train, for example, the legislation on tobacco, under no circumstances should that be derailed. We need to move on with that. That is very important legislation. I mean, we talk about patient safety and patient health. Well, surely that, that has to be one of the, the top items on the agenda. And we need to move on with that. It was due to go to inter-service consultation yeah. uh, on Monday, next Monday, and that's now not taking place. And the Commission have said that such a consultation will only take place when a new Maltese Commissioner is appointed. That clearly indicates that the legislation is going to find it difficult to come in before the end of this Commission. It does, and uh, that, that's news to me. I wasn't actually aware of that, and that is very concerning. I don't know why the Commission have made that decision. I think, I mean, there is obviously a temporary, I think uh, Commissioner Shevkovich, I think, has taken over yeah. or whatever. I, I don't know why that isn't sufficient in these circumstances. I think we need a full explanation from the Commission on that, because a lot of work has been done on this. I think it's time to move with it, and there is always the danger that when something gets stalled, then the next thing we know is we're looking at European elections, new commissioner, we don't know what the priorities are. When Commissioner Daly was appointed, you know, this was one of his priorities. Citizens and those of us in the Parliament who support that legislation have a right to expect that the Commissioner's priorities will be dealt with. So I would like a full explanation from the Commission as to why this is so and what is the point if you, to appoint a caretaker commissioner if he cannot proceed with the work of the Commission. Uh, other than that, obviously, we need to know that whatever investigation is taking place, we want a time frame on it and to know when it will be completed and we can get on with the business either with Commissioner Daly or another Commissioner. Something that no doubt you and your colleagues will be watching closely. Very. Uh, thank you very much, Marion Harkin. Uh, I'm Jeremy Fleming from Euractiv and I've been speaking to Marion Harkin, an independent MEP on some health issues.